Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. It's September, so I'm going to make a video for Septandi. I don't always manage to make these C-themed month videos, and that's because my video pipeline is such that it's sometimes months ahead when I'm working on videos, and it would take a lot of planning and organization to get videos out in the right month to match up, and I don't always do that. But this is a TRS-80 Model 2, a really rough one here, which you're going to be taking a look at on today's video, so it fits right in with Septandi. So search for hashtag Septandi on YouTube if you want to see videos from other creators that deal with Tandy-type machines, which are computers that were designed and released by Radio Shack out of Dallas, Fort Worth, and sold all around the world, well, at least in the UK and Australia and the United States and Canada. So anyhow, enough babbling. Let's take a look at this machine. So without further ado, let's get right to it. The TRS-80 line of machines all started in 1977 with the TRS-80 Model 1. I'm not sure it was called the Model 1 at the time. I think it was just the TRS-80, but eventually it became known as the Model 1 as it was the first machine that Radio Shack released. They followed up the Model 1 with a Model 3, which I've shown on this channel, I think. Well, maybe, <laughs> but I, ha I have one. And there's a Model 4, which I've definitely shown on this channel. And there's also a 4P, which is a slightly more portable version. The TRS-80 Model 1, 3, and 4 were all aimed at the home computer market with the Model 1 coming out in 1977 and being a competitor to the original Commodore PET and the original Apple II. The Model 2, which you see here, was Radio Shack's first attempt released in 1979 to produce a machine that was aimed directly at the business market. According to Wikipedia, it was released for $3,450, this computer right here, which was the equivalent in 2020 dollars of $12,300. This machine also runs a Z80 processor, runs at four megahertz, and could either come with 64 or 32K of RAM. You might be noticing it has an integrated disk drive here, and yes, it's an eight inch disk drive. This computer was not software compatible at all with the original Model 1 or the three and the four software. It was a totally separate line of computers, like I said, aimed at a totally different market. This machine was also the first in a line of business machines that Radio Shack released. I think there was the Model 12 and the Model 16, and there was the Model 16B. And all of those machines are software compatible with this original two, and none of them are compatible with the other ones. Wikipedia has a pretty good article on the Model 2 if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about this machine. But in this video, this computer is really in rough condition, and I have no idea if there's even a chance that this thing works or can work. So I think in this first video of what will become a little bit of a series, I'm just gonna take this thing apart and we'll peek inside to see how rough the condition is. Cause I think it's, it's gonna be pretty rough. So unlike the original Model 1, of course, this has a built-in CRT, it's gonna be monochrome. I'm quite sure it's a white phosphor, although I'm not totally sure. There are two switches on the front here. We have a power switch, which I don't know if that even works. And then there's a reset button and the reset button definitely, I don't think works. It's very floppy. I love how it says TRS-80 Model 2 microcomputer in pretty huge writing, considering that's staring you in the face. Here is the eight inch disk drive, which uh, these things are pretty robust. So it may work. Luckily, I do have a spare one of these, not from this computer, but it looks to be the identical mechanism to this. I think these were all made by Sugart. You push this button here and that should release the mechanism. It does, I think it would pop the disc out if there were one inserted in there. This machine has a detachable keyboard, which is detached. Uh, there's a cable here. Unfortunately, if I spin this around, the keyboard is a little worse for wear. It looks like this is the DIN connector for it and it has been yanked out or snapped off, and there's a break in the plastic right there. There's a standoff that was inside the keyboard that came out when I moved it, so might have to epoxy that back together. 
And the keyboard itself has a pretty big layout, as in there's a lot of keys. I am 99.9% .9 sure this is a foam and foil keyboard, meaning at the minimum, I'm gonna have to use those foam replacement pads from Textilec to get this keyboard working again. It's filthy, but at least it seems to be in okay shape. Like it's not, the keys move okay. They're a little scratchy. Luckily with foam and foil keyboards, once you pop the foam pads out, take the circuit board off the back, you could just wash this whole thing uh, under the faucet with lots of soap and water. Unfortunately, the badge is looking pretty sad here on the keyboard. Um, it's sort of a, a rubbery plastic and it has yellowed significantly. The rest of this machine is painted. So you'll see here on the edge of the keyboard, it's very worn from wrists that were resting on this thing. Obviously this computer got a lot of use. So that's good. It wasn't just thrown away brand new. It, it was heavily used. Um, but yeah, to, without repainting the entire case, there's not a lot you can do about that. At least the plastic underneath is gray and it's not white or black. So it wouldn't, it's not super ugly that the silver paint is missing. Now I'm kind of exploring this machine for the first time myself. Um, the keyboard cable, I think it feeds in. I, I'm, I'm not sure if this has a mechanism like a, a, an old vacuum cleaner where you pull the cord and it, it feeds back in. Seems like it, it could possibly go, go back in. We have a couple controls for the monitor down here. I think there's a brightness and a contrast knob and they both are moving, so they're not frozen. That's good. I'm gonna try to turn this machine around. It's really heavy. And I think that primarily is because eight inch disc drives are notoriously heavy as well. In fact, it's funny about the eight inch disc drives the motor spindle that drives the disc, that spins the disc, actually runs at mains voltage. So in the case of this machine, of course, 120 volts, it's not software controlled, so it doesn't like stop and start from a disc command like five and a quarter inch or three and a half inches do. They're always turning, but it's a really big, chunky, synchronous AC motor that uh, basically is locked to the line frequency of 60 hertz here to spin the disc at the correct speed. On the back, and here we go. Let's flip this around. Whoa, it fell off the desk here. There we go. All right, looking at the back of the computer, this is what I was talking about with, uh, I'm not sure if this machine's ever gonna work. There is a lot of rust back here on the back panel. Um, it's metal and um, it's definitely seen better days. So this thing here, uh, it says, disc terminator for the TRS-80 Model 2. I assume you can connect an external floppy drive to this port right here. Um, and this is the terminating resistor pack when you don't have an external drive connected. And actually, yes, it does say disk expansion right here. Here it says parallel printer channel. And this looks like an IEC type connector. And then right here we have two serial ports, serial channels A and B. There's a fuse and there's AC power. And the whole plate really rusty and a lot of bug residue back here. Even the badge here is definitely seen better days as well, but there it is, Radio Shack catalog number 26, 4002, TRS-80 Model 2, and 120 volts, 60 hertz, and 198 VA, I think that's what it says, which means uh, probably around 200 watts or 250 watts or thereabouts. Now you might be noticing that the case here looks like it's not attached. And that is the, the case. It was exactly like this when I received this machine. It was missing the top screws here. So I don't know what's going on, if this thing's been gutted for parts or whatnot, but let's crack it open and take a look. All right, I put on some gloves here because there's probably a lot of bugs because just on the back, there was a ton of bugs. Let's just lift the case. Yep, lots of bug residue inside of here. It's little specs and whatnot. So I'm probably gonna throw this into the sink right now and let this soak in warm water. Well, well, that is pretty dirty in there. There is a lot of spider webs and, and whatnot. Um, I'm probably just gonna have to take this apart. Anyways, okay, well enough. Uh, I'm a little bit in shock, but let's uh, let's take a look at what we see in here. So this is honestly the first time I've ever looked inside one of these machines. So I'm completely this is all new territory to me. Now, um, we can definitely see that 
there are expansion boards. So it looks like there's a total of eight slots. And I'm imagining that this thing probably uses some kind of a backplane. I don't know if it even has a motherboard, but maybe it does down below where we saw those ports. And these things here are, are just um, option cards or something like that. The dead bug situation in here, there is a lot of eggs, uh, spider eggs and things down there. I think it's all old and desiccated, but this thing clearly was in like a shed or garage or someplace, maybe even outside, I don't know, that exposed it to a lot of bugs. And they definitely took up residence in here. Now I kind of want to take out these expansion cards. And the interesting thing is, is it doesn't look like they slide into a chassis here. There's this bar that just holds them in place. And once that's off, you probably pop them out and lift them up to get them out of the case. Cause obviously this part of the case is permanent. That doesn't come off. So I think I need to just take these things out so I can get a better look at what the situation is inside of here. It seems to be an eight millimeter nut. Now, knowing Radio Shack, there will be a really good service manual for this. And I should probably be just looking at that as opposed to um, guessing at how to do this. But hey, you know what? Sometimes it's fun to kind of operate <laughs> blindly. I don't want to drop all these things inside. Don't fall. There we go. Okay, so this bar should come out. There it is really quite dirty. It's got some foam on there, plastic on the top, and we have a lot of spiders. Okay, so we're gonna start with this board here on the left. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that one because it's connected. Let's pull off the next one. This looks to be 4116, so this is gonna be 64 kilobytes of RAM. And I'm kind of imagining that it's possible to install multiple of these and maybe expand this thing beyond uh, the 64K that's probably in this machine. All right, next up is a disc controller. Now, eight and a half inch drives have 50 pin connectors. That was not one of them, but this next one probably is. And needless to say, I think because of age and or corrosion, these boards are very, very stuck in here. So 50 pin ribbon here, this is what goes to the sugar drive. Now it doesn't have any really additional signaling over five and a quarter inch disc drive. So you can build a, an adapter. Well, there's that board. Now taking a look, there is quite a bit of corrosion right here. It's probably something that could clean up. That's not from battery leakage or anything like that. That's kind of why it was so hard to take this, this connector off. Look at the, um, there's a line on there and that's because of corrosion. But you can definitely see that water had been pouring into this computer along here, and that would be through the vents in the top of the case. So that's why I just don't know how well this is gonna work. Yeah, there's just corrosion all the way along here. Didn't look at the back of the other board, but it says Tandy Corp 1979 here. This is the back of the RAM card there, also says 1979 Tandy Corporation. And hopefully you can see in the camera there, like there's a good amount of corrosion right there on that pin. And uh, yeah, it's just a lot of filth on these boards. Maybe it'll wash off, maybe. All right, let's see this next board. So it had a connector that went to the front panel, it looks like. And let's see, there's a big ribbon cable here. So the corrosion from the water that's running down this thing makes these connectors really hard to get off. Luckily they're gold, these are gold at least. So when you look here, you see Zilog chips and you might think that this is the CPU board, but I actually don't think so. This one here is, um, who knows what that chip is. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. This board's in pretty good shape. Not a ton of corrosion on this one. All right, and lastly is this board, which I've already removed. You know what, I'm gonna grab a marker. I'm just gonna draw a couple marks on there just so I know how to get those back on. All right, so on this one, I'm gonna put two marks. And on this one, I'll just put one. <laughs> there was some Celastic on here to try to hold these connectors on. They are keyed differently, so I didn't have to worry about the, uh, look at all this <laughs> spider stuff, oh boy. Um, it looks like this one here goes over to the CRT board. So this is definitely the video signal. And the other one, it looks like it's going around and under the disk drive. So I don't know. Could be that that's like the brightness and contrast. 
Not sure. All right, well, clearly this board is the video display board. So it's got a 6845 CRT controller there. It's got some video RAM right here, which is static RAM. There's a bunch of pine needles. <laughs> and that's it. So I guess this other board here, I guess one of these was the CPU. I didn't recognize which one that was, but I'm just not familiar with my Zilog chipset part numbers. So one of those must have been the CPU. Well, now looking inside, you can kind of get an idea for the debris in there. Look at all those, see those little balls? I think those are spider balls or something. I, I'm not totally sure, but um, this computer clearly will need a complete disassembly and deep cleaning. So I took the boards and I just gave them a good wash and scrub with soapy warm water. A little bit of a soak as well. A lot of filth came off of them. Definitely looks a lot cleaner, at least while they're wet. And I think just so I can continue to work on this, I'm gonna use this thing here, a data vac, and I'm going to just try to vacuum up some of the cobwebs and debris and stuff that's in here. I really need to set up a better camera angle to get views inside machines from the top down over on this other bench, because I just didn't really show how much filth and debris was inside this machine, which I was vacuuming up. Well, it's a little bit cleaner, but obviously the real way to clean this thing is to take it completely apart. And yes, I will have to hose it out. But while I was vacuuming, I noticed, and I'm putting my hands through a bunch of cobwebs. Look at this. Is this normally something you find inside a computer? Um, <laughs> a maple leaf? And no, that doesn't mean it's because it came from Canada. It's because uh, here in uh, Portland, there are tons and tons of maple trees. So there's a fan, a big fan down there and the, and I can see little pieces of, more pieces of leaf that are stuck on the fan. Uh, this was just sitting on the fan. Now the eight inch disc drive, this is the chunky AC motor there and I can see a drive belt that goes from this motor to the spindle. And if I reach down and I turn the spindle, it does turn, but it doesn't feel good. Uh, the bearings are probably totally shot on this disc drive. So you see this thing here, this silver large thing? I am pretty sure that this is the AC run capacitor for this AC motor. But I do know AC motors that run directly on mains, they do need a run capacitor. I think a start and a run capacitor, which might be what this is, a start and a run. So it probably has several uh, con connections to it that go to the motor. I can see some, some leads there. But yeah, anyways, um, the bearings are probably gonna be garbage on this thing, but I'm just going to continue taking this apart. After a little bit of looking around on the machine, it looks like the front panel comes off next. So I started looking for all those screws that might hold the front panel on, which includes some on the front, and started taking them all out. Now, even with the front panel screws removed, there are several wires that go to the switches and the knobs that are on the front panel, which you have to figure out how to disconnect. As I had mentioned, this was the first time I'd ever seen one of these computers before and definitely never worked on one or taken one apart. So it was all a learning experience and was me figuring it all out as I went along. The two knobs on the front, there are little metal rings that hold those knobs into place. Instead of a usual nut on the potentiometer, you have to push the potentiometers through those rings to release them. I then removed the two screws that hold the power switch on so I could tuck that back in the chassis. A little bit of vacuuming to clear out the plethora of dead bugs and other things that were around, and a quick clean to the CRT made this thing look a lot better. Well, a little bit of cleaning goes a long way. Uh, judging by the fact that there's like so many pine needles and leaves inside of this computer, like here's another one right here, another maple leaf, with a lot of spider webs. Uh, this machine had to have been outside. There's just no other way that it would have this much plant debris inside and bugs. 
Now, it didn't get directly rained on, so I have a feeling this thing was covered to some extent. Maybe it was under like a carport or something. Yeah, the fact that there's so many leaves, maybe the cover was off and in the fall, like leaves would be blowing around in the wind and it would end up inside of this computer. I still haven't exactly figured out how to get the chassis, which obviously this thing is mounted inside of. The plastic shell just goes around the chassis. I haven't figured out how to get the chassis out yet. But you can see the disk drive here. There's the spindle motor and actually it turns a little bit better than it was when I first turned it. It was definitely stuck, but just turning it by hand has got it going. So maybe that can actually run at normal speed. Now it's all about figuring out how to get this chassis out of the plastic case. There are definitely screws on the bottom that you remove to do that, but it's not clear which are the screws that do it because some of the screws are for holding down the disk drive, for instance, or other parts to the metal chassis. So it's just a little bit of trial and error. A little bit of a lift on the chassis confirms that it's starting to come away from the bottom but it's not quite released. Most of the screws are pretty easy to access, but one of the screws for removing the chassis is sandwiched between the power supply and the CRT board and is very difficult to get to. So the chassis is loosened and now all that's holding it in are the AC cords here. Looks like I have to unscrew the IEC input and the, take the fuse holder out. The screws on the back of the computer are really rusty. So hopefully this actually comes out. Okay, that one came out. So, uh, okay, there's the mains. Input disconnected. I dropped a, a washer. <clears throat> uh, the fuse holder. I'm gonna just unplug this. <laughs> it's uh, It's got two spade connectors and I don't see any other way to get it off. There we go. So I need to figure out how to get this out of here. And I think if I lift from here, it should come out. Maybe, there we go. Wow, it's heavy. It is so heavy. So basically, other than the very dangerous 70s wiring here of like exposed mains, this could run like this. You don't need the rest of the case at all to use this. So right here, this cable, I unplugged it off the disk drive. It comes directly, I guess it comes off the power supply, but I'm assuming the power switch on the front actually uh, turns this off and on. Okay, so this plugs in right here, which is where the start run capacitor is and the motor. Now look at this, uh, my tool here. I knew that was gonna happen. I had to use this really long screwdriver um, with extensions and sockets to get to that screw that was down there that was holding this chassis in. And unfortunately, um, all the screwdrivers I had would not reach all the way down there. What a dumb design that it's sandwiched between these two boards. I don't know how well this is gonna show up, but there's a little terminal block down here for, I guess, mains power distribution and it's all rusty. All the screws right there, rusty. But I, I'm assuming this is full mains voltage exposed just right there, like it's not covered or anything. I mean, I know this is the high voltage analog board right here, so you shouldn't be poking around there, but it's still just, it's so funny. That's such a thing of the 70s. Like it's just not something you would ever see in much newer stuff, that's for sure. All right, so I'd like to try to get my socket out between these two boards. I think the best thing to do is take this screw off here, or attempt to at least. This holds the um, CRT driver board on. And if I do that, I can bend the board out of the way. It's held on by four screws and standoffs. Everything is very corroded. There we go. All right, there we go. There is my socket. What I want to do is just take out the entire power supply slash CRT board, which I'm pretty sure is held on with a screw down here. Let's get this screw out. Everything is just very inaccessible. <laughs> Let's get this screw out. 
And I think there are two screws plus the one that holds the chassis into the case that hold the power supply and analog board down. And yes, that is loose now. It appears that the CRT board is very much permanently connected to things here. Like there's, these are soldered on. I have to take the deflection yoke off if I want to uh, pull this away. And the problem is the ground lead here. Oh, that does come off at least, okay. Okay, these are power supply board connections. So this would be mains, I guess, and this is DC voltage right here. And this cable here appears to be a uh, connection to the CRT board. And there's a ground lead down here amongst all the incredible amount of dead bugs. All right, now I do have to remove this deflection yoke. Oh yeah, that's very crusty. Oh, I can't get that off though because this cage board is in the way. <laughs> this whole thing is so like, oh. It's like you obviously have to remove the cage before you can take the CRT out. And these wires here are soldered onto the board. There's not a connector. Oh, you know what? There is a connector, but I, I don't want to touch that. That's fragile. All right, well, next out is the cage then. Looks like it's got four screws. You have to use a really long screwdriver, just like um, I've been doing. <sighs> okay, and before I can get the two screws that are on this side, I think I need to uh, take the disk drive out. <laughs> like, I don't think it's possible without doing that. So let's see, how do we get the floppy out? All right, so there's some very big screws down here. Kind of assume to have, uh, I already took one out when I was trying to take the chassis out. Wouldn't be surprised if there's four. Okay, there's that one. Uh, there's one on the front here. This is for the disk drive. Oh, come on, it's really tight. And there is one on the top right here. Is this free? No, it's not free. There's still one more down between the cage. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. So the bolt that's left is in between the disk drive and the cage, and it is so deep down in there that I can't, even this monstrosity here is not long enough. All right, uh, all I have that might possibly work is this, <laughs> but this might be too thick. Let's see. Oh, it's not, okay. This is ridiculous. These tools you need to take this computer apart. What really has me questioning this process, I don't even know how I'm gonna reassemble this stuff. Um, my socket thing here is not magnetic. This might be like a one-way process, a one-way ticket for this TRS-80. Might as well get the screw out for the cage while we're at it. The cage, uh, what's happening here? It's got like a power cable on it. Ugh, okay, let's get the disk drive off. This at least, I can unplug these connectors. That one, and this is DC power. And this should come out now, I think. There we go. That's the uh, eight inch floppy drive. Whoa, whoa. And there is the cage. You can see there's a, a little maple leaf uh, propeller thing there on the fan. <laughs> okay. This is the power switch here. It's in a little plastic holder. Now what's preventing removing the cage are these things here. One's holding the high voltage anode cable and one's holding like a, uh, I guess the focus or something. So how exactly do these come apart? I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's been so hot it melted, I don't know. I'm very tempted to just cut it. No, I got it, okay, there we go. That was so incredibly fiddly. Okay, and we're not home free yet. 
because these are zip tied on. <laughs> this is like a one way assembly process. Really, they didn't. Obviously, this is uh, not a home computer, so it was not designed to be serviced by regular folks. You know, this would be you'd call it, I guess, a technician, I guess. I don't know. And then we have a DC cable on the back plane, which obviously gives it plus five, minus five, you know, all the stuff it needs for the RAM, 12 volts. There it is, there's the cage. The, uh, not the cage, well, yeah, it is a cage, but there's the back plane. And as you can see, good amount of corrosion in there. But the PCB, it looks fine. I'm gonna say that's fine. Definitely some rust on these nuts back here. All right, and I think we are pretty much almost free to go to get this off. So I can take this off. Deflection yoke should slide off now. There we go. Took this um, piece of tape with it. High voltage cap here is looking a little worse for wear. I'm just gonna grab a cloth, try to clean that up a little bit. Here's some WD-40. Sprays two ways. Oh, I didn't even notice you can spray it this way. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at that. It takes a, all that gunk right off. There we go, the anode cap is off. Just gonna wipe down this around the here where it's all sticky. So at this point, I can actually remove the power supply board. Just make sure everything is disconnected and the CRT driver so I can give this thing a closer inspection. There's the power supply from the TRS-80 Model 2, and there's the CRT board complete with pine needles and tons of dead bugs. Blah. So that was way more work than I anticipated. Um, I think I'm gonna end this video here, and I have a lot of cleaning to do. So before my next video on this machine, I will have probably just taken apart the rest of this it, there's nothing much more to it, right? Just take off some screws and really clean off this bottom plate uh, and maybe replace this, this distribution block here, which is all rusty, you know, that kind of quick maintenance stuff. So in part two, I will probably test the CRT. We could test the CRT and the driver board, see if it runs the CRT properly. I can probably generate some sync signals. I will have to look up what video signal this thing runs at, but it's all in the technical manual. Maybe um, we can check out the disk drive, which I'm pointing to on the floor there. Uh, see if that's working, is going to run. Maybe hook it up to a PC, something like that. Clean up the this drive cage board and finish cleaning up the circuit boards that were in there. And of course, that all those ribbon cables that were hooked up to those ports. I really need to take that out as well and try to clean that. So yeah, uh, there's still a ton of work to do, a ton of work to do on this machine, and I guess my biggest worry is that I'm going to forget how to put this thing back together. It's like a puzzle, so I should be able to figure it out. <laughs> Anyhow, that's it for my Septandi video on the Model 2. So if you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. And if you have experience with these machines, if you can recommend software to use, if this thing ever does work, maybe there's some good software I can use with it. Um, I actually have some blank eight inch discs, so it's quite possible I could hook the drive up to a PC and image a downloaded image onto an eight inch disc, or I could wire in a GoTech as well. GoTex, I think, can hook up to an eight inch drive. There's some extra signaling on these that maybe the GoTech can't emulate. I'm not sure. I have to read up on that. There's a lot to read up on this machine, because like I said, I know pretty much nothing about it. So. There we go. All right, that is gonna be it. Oh, wait, I've almost forgot to say, thanks for my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the screen. If you wanna be a patron, you can do so at the link below. Check out the second channel, all that stuff. Okay, for now, for real, this time, it's the end of this video. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.